Hi everyone, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Nick Levette uh, from UK Coaching. Hi Nick, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I am very well. Uh, I'm really excited to be speaking to you, mate, because oh. I'm a, I'm, we've met a few times, but mm, uh, yeah. I'm a, a, a long time admirer of your work and the stuff you've done historically with the FA and you're now doing uh with it's UK coaching isn't it that you're it is that's right yeah yeah okay cool so look for those people I I would imagine 99.9% of people who listen to the sports site show know exactly who you are but for the 0.0001 you flatter me you flatter me you flirt that's 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 my job mate that's why I'm a sports site guy (laughs) I build I I, I often break to build but now I'm going to build to build (laughs) so um yeah just for those 0.001% who have been hiding in their box for the last decade or so if you'd like to introduce yourself, what have you done for the last 10 years? Who are you? Where you're from, etc., etc. Uh, well, um, I mean, it's a hell of an introduction. Uh, I, I, I'm just a bloke that kind of rambles about coaching, really. Uh, that has a rant every now and then when something just kind of frustrates me. Uh, um, so, yeah, I worked at, uh, I worked at football, uh, the, the Football Federation in England, the Football Association for... 14 years um, in a variety of kind of national remit roles from national manager for, for youth football, kind of 5 to 21s, looking at the pathway and changing that around competition and doing some some pretty fun stuff there. Um, uh, and when I left there in December last year, I'd been talent ID manager for three years, embedded in with England teams from kind of 15s to seniors doing some some pretty cool stuff with those guys, which was quite fun. Um, uh, coached for, I was trying to work it out the other day. I started coaching when I was 17, so like 24 years. I know it's, it's quite scary, actually, 24 years of coaching. Although whether I've actually done 24 years of coaching is probably something we might get onto. Uh, <laughs> I've, done, I've done 24 years of working with, with kids. Let's, let's say that. Um, uh, and I'm now head of talent and performance at UK Coaching where I've kind of broadened out from from football, taken those kind of institutionalised blinkers off um, and now work with uh, a a team of people there that develop, well, our kind of focus for our team is developing coaches that work typically in the Olympic pathway, uh, uh, supporting coaches that come into kind of like the first rung of the talent pathway for when, so when when a kid's picked for something. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm going to go, right, am I going to have Dan or Josh Right, uh, let's pick Dan. That kind of first moment. Um, so we, we work with those coaches all the way through to, well, ones that will probably go to the next Olympic Games. Um, just kind of helping them get a bit better at coaching, really. Um, so, yeah, so I've kind of, I've done my, done my time in coaching, grassroots, under eight teams, all the way through to working at Category 1 clubs with 10, 12 kids that have gone on to play for England youth teams that have won World Cups that have played in the Premier League. So a, a variety of stuff, really, but... Yeah, I just just have a rant and a ramble about coaching every now and then. Really, my basic mathematics skills. If you've been coaching for twenty four years since you were seventeen, makes us exactly the same age, mate. And I'm looking oh, at you. Yeah. I'm looking at you through the prism of Skype, and I'm kind of thinking, you've got far less grey hair than me. Oh, no, no, no! Don't be surprised. Look at the <laughs> same side there. I, and oh, I'm right, you're hiding it. You're hiding it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just the angle of the camera you've got to work on. You see. Um, and I didn't have any grey hair till I started working for the FA, so I'm not quite sure what that tells you. But uh, uh, I, and I, I had a, a very light paper round, I would suggest. So, yeah. <laughs> coaching for 24 years, mate. Coaching for 24 years with the FA for for, for 14 years, and and with um, UK coaching, working with uh, Olympic coaches. So I think that that's a, a fascinating journey. You must have seen. Um, some changes along the way i know you've mm. implemented changes but what what's changed for you i mean obviously you're a much more experienced coach now but 
the work you've been doing, the people that you've been working with, the the organizations you've uh, embedded yourself into over the years. When you first came out and coached for the first five years, six, seven, eight years, how did you see coaching? Has that changed? Do you coach in a different way now? Has there been enormous shifts? Massive. Yeah, like, uh, I think... Yeah, it's pro- and it's probably down to a, a variety of different reasons. Um, I, I, I look back at, at how I first started coaching, and um, I'd be horrified if I watched myself back coaching now. Um, and, and I followed a fairly kind of um, normal path in the sense that, you know, my, I, I can still remember my first paid coaching job, which was running uh, soccer schools for Jerry Armstrong, with the old Northern Ireland player. Yeah, yeah I remember him. Uh, I, I was running some soccer schools for, with, for him in Sussex, which is where I'm from. Um, and I was working with a coach who I'm still good friends with now and we still have some fantastic debates because he's an absolute dinosaur, this guy. Uh, but he's a very good, he's a very good friend of mine. Um, uh, and, and as a young coach, uh, probably 19, I think it was, it was while I was at university, um, I, I coached like him. I just copied the person who was my boss, line manager, senior coach at the time. And I just fell into this path of socialization like everybody else does. You know, you, you coach like the people around you. Yep. Um, and I, I thought his his way to coach was the way to coach. Um, and it, uh, it was probably, uh, well, a, a, a long while after that before I started to realize that there was some alternatives. Um, because I think at that time I'd also gone through a, a fairly classic coach education pathway of, um, you know, I've done my level two as it stood at the time. Mm. Uh, when they first kind of brought that out and it was very, you know, technique in isolation, you build it up to a skill practice. Then you focus on small side again. You put your non-kicking foot here. You put your kicking foot here. All that kind of, you know, uh, structured practice from isolated to game. You know, I, I didn't know any other way because I'd done the FA coaching course. Mm. I, I believe that that was the right way to do it because that was the course of training that I've been on and the coach I was working with at the time did similar, you know, and he was a, a very traditional UEFA B coach, you know, every session finished with crossing and finishing um, and that was the way he worked. So I just kind of fell in line with that really. Um, so, uh, but how I, how I view the world as, as coaching now, it, it's a fundamental shift I think really from thinking about the sport, thinking about people. You know, I, I would suggest that's probably the biggest shift. Um, and, and I could probably pinpoint some fairly key milestones along the way in terms of people that I've been around and immersed with that have have created that fundamental shift in my coaching. Um, but very clearly say, right, it, you know, so someone like um, John Allpress, uh, Craig Simmons at the FA, two two very different people. Craig, um, many many people know Simo. He, he retired now in his seventies. Um, just you know, just one of the smartest people I've ever met uh, because he started to look at the whole person. Okay, it it was how does how do the biological, psychological, and social factors blend? and play off against each other within this game that we just happen to be helping the kids get better at. Um, who, who, he, he probably just, yeah, fundamentally made me shift and think about the world differently. Um, and then John Allpress, uh, as a coach, you know, really fortunate to spend time with John, a guy called Pete for Vivian, uh, uh, that just everything was about through the game. You know, practices were games. Um, and it kind of got to the stage where, like in my own language, I banned the word drill. You know, uh, drills just make kids think of the dentist, you know, and not many people have the dentist as a hobby uh, uh, or, or they think of the military. And uh, kids don't want to do drills. They want to play games. They want to have fun and it's activities. And uh, so I would say there's, you know, been some crucial people along the way. Um, and another person that I would probably suggest is a lady called Lynn Kidman. Yep. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you ever had the fortune of meeting Lynn, 
but Lynn was incredible and uh she's got a, a couple of books uh I, i'm I, i'm not on royalties for selling her books but um if you're a coach and you're listening to this two books i think there's one about called develop developing decision makers and one called athlete centered coaching like these should be the bibles of, of coaching practice really but but her work was whether whether it was grassroots or elite you know she was embedded with the all blacks like she's a, 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 a an aussie lady um but worked closely with the all blacks at the very highest level and was doing game-based coaching um you know and uh, yeah, I would say those those kind of people have, have fundamentally shifted how I think about stuff. So, um, and it's a bit of a long answer to how has your coaching changed when the answer is yes. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah uh, hugely, I would suggest, and thankfully as well. But I mean, but I guess you must have changed along the way too, right? Enormously, enormously so. Um, and I would actually say in the last couple of years, um, mm. my view. You know, listening to people like yourself, the names you've mentioned, Stuart Armstrong, others in the Skillac space. I suppose, uh, as you know, Nick, my background is, is golf. I was a golf coach. And the traditional form of golf coaching is we stand on the range. Somebody comes along, help, help me improve. Okay, get your seven iron out. Let's work on your swing. Um, take the swing to pieces. <laughs> video, yeah, sure. video analysis, etc., etc. And that's how I first started coaching when I was sort of twenty, twenty-one, as I was competing as well. And in terms of being person-centered, I mean that changed as I started to do my psychology qualifications in my twenties. So. So that started early. So the, the, the person-centered piece that you allude to, for me, that started quite early. In terms of how people within a sport acquire skill, that really, that landscape has changed for me, has shifted for me, not from one end of the continuum to the other end of the continuum, but probably a small shift into the middle. Um, from listening, as I say, to, to the Skillac community and, and actually learning a different way of doing things, which isn't just, as you allude to, drill, drill, drill. It isn't just yeah. put, put yourself into this position, an information processing approach, if you like, and more of what can I do in the environment? What can I constrain, a, a constraints-led approach um, to be able to help somebody develop their skill and along that way they'll find their best their optimal technique for themselves now i think i mean it'd be interesting to get your feedback on this nick because i just think i know that there's uh, debates argument is a strong word there's debates on twitter between various factions of skill act and sports site community and uh some are sort of saying it's information processing. It's we t- we have this information in our head, and we have to pass on this knowledge and 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 help players move better in that way, and 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 learn the functional movements, and and that's the most appropriate way to do it. You've got uh, others on the opposite side, which is the constraints led. We change the environment to change player skills. What I've tried to do, Nick, and I don't know where you lie with this, but I've tried to sort of almost take myself above the argument. Now I'm not a I'm a psychological coach, obviously, but I'm, I'm not coaching golf anymore and I don't coach teams, but I have a real interest, interest in skill act. I take myself above the landscape and I, at the moment I, I refuse to commit to one way or t'other because I can see advantages with both. And I, and I know this, this idea of it depends winds people up um, and it winds me up sometimes, but also I do think, if I think in golf, uh, the golfing landscape sometimes it does depend and, and, and when I work at the elite level of football the reality is is that the managers and the coaches I'm working alongside they've got to prepare players for Saturday you know yeah. there's not a lot of space for um, questioning there's not a lot of space for divergency it's like we're playing Manchester City we've got to go you know we've got to have a shape here we've got to go win um, 
So I've tried to take myself above this landscape and look at both. And I do fall into perhaps into that it depends at times. But it would be interesting to get your take on that sort of landscape right now. Yeah. Um, I think the wonders of, um, of Skype for me and you sitting here, what we don't see is when Dan's talking about the golf technique, his hands naturally go into the position of making a swing. <laughs> which is brilliant which I, I i love coaches that really kind of get animated about it like that which people won't see on a podcast but it's made me smile um and and, and yeah, if people could like, see that they would have seen a very uh, a grip that would have delivered a very shut club face that would have sent the ball miles <laughs> left i would have snap hooked it that i tended to do my last ever tournaments were on the riviera tour down in france that sounds lovely doesn't it the riviera tour but it was painstakingly bad as every shot careered miles left and i was like i really need to go and do another living here anyway moving on <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so look, i'm kind of with you in the sense that uh it, you need to be able to move along the continuum yeah. but what i think is really important is is coaches understand why they're doing something yeah. uh I, I don't think it's necessarily an either or um, and someone like Stuart that you mentioned, who has you know fairly strong views on things, um, I think Stuart's been well placed because what he's done is he's. If you want to get any shift, you've got to go extreme to move people further. Yes. Uh, if, if 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 you sit in the middle, people don't move very much. So I, I totally support kind of his his angle on stuff. Um, so I think for me is yeah, uh, it, it's it's knowing why you're doing something really. So if I need to do an isolated practice, why? Why am I doing it? Is it for the benefit of the kids? I think a lot of coaches that work in team sports, um, if they're doing isolated practices when they've got all the kids there, I don't think that's necessarily a great use of time because you don't often, certainly grassroots, for example, you know, they might have the kids together for training for once a week, sometimes twice a week if you're lucky. So why focus on individual stuff that the kids could do away from there on their own? So when you've got kids together in groups, do group stuff. I think is simple things because you get the returns around the social side of things, which you can't get when the kids aren't together. So I think I think you just have to maximise the use of that in a different way. But if a kid needs some isolated work, that's fine. But set it up in a in a smarter way that kind of that can maximise your use of time. So. I think you just have to know why. So if you want to get decision makers, which typically most game sports uh, need, you have to then match that to your coaching style. So if you want to, if you use command style, you will not develop decision makers. You need to use divergent discovery, convergent discovery, the kind of things that you just talked about there, if you want to develop decision makers. So it, it just goes back to knowing why you're doing what you're doing. And it's your professional judgment as a coach um the, it depends argument um yes i'm again i'm, I'm, I'm with you it, it does depend it does depend on a whole host of factors but where it started annoying me is people hide behind it depends it's a yeah. cop out now okay. it depends on what 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 does it depend on so don't just say it depends of course it depends but it depends on what and therefore what do you do so if a kid is X, then I do Y. OK, fine. You know, you've made a decision because I've seen this. Therefore, I do this. Not just say, well, I've seen this, but well, well it just it depends. And that's what really starts to pee me off about that kind of argument. Uh, and I had a conversation with somebody that, you know, that uses it a lot. Um, and, I, and I said to him, but but share that. You know, you're a really experienced guy. Share what it depends on and therefore what you would do. And he said, well, yeah, but you're going to have to pay me for the pleasure of that. And I'm like, that's, that's crap. I'm not interested in that. You know, I, 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 just want to, I, I just want to help coaches get better. Because if we help coaches get better, it helps the kids have a better time. And, and ultimately, that's the kind of stuff that drives me. That's the bit that I'm interested in. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, the, the message that's kind of needs to come across is just be nice to kids. You know, so whether you use a games-based approach or a dual-based approach, what, like, you know, you, you'll do what you do once you've made a proper judgment on stuff, but do it and be nice to kids in the same way. Um, so, and I, I get the, you know, you've got to prepare for a game at the elite end on Saturday, 
But the other thing is that is it it doesn't have to be all about questioning. I, I think sometimes it's about involving people, not just doing to people. And this is this is regardless of the age group or the level or the sport. So I was having a conversation with a Premier League manager, uh, and he's been around a few clubs. Uh, uh, and we, I was talking to him about set pieces. And I said to him, well, what happens with set pieces? Do you go in as a new manager, you tell them what they are, you put them up. He was like, yeah, every place I've been to, I lead it. I put them on. The, I said, right, OK. I said, but uh, when you go in, have a look around the, the meeting room or the changing room. How many players you got there? 15, 16, right. How many years have they all been playing? 10, 15, 20 years. How many managers have they all played for? Four, five, six, eight you know, multiples of multiples or multiples. How much experience is there in the room looking at you and knowledge of years versus you looking at them? So why don't you involve the players in deciding what the set pieces are? Ask them what, you know, you can set a task, right, look around the changing room. What are our strengths? Therefore, what set pieces do we need to use to maximise our strengths? And I bet you get to the same outcomes that you would do if you'd have just told them But actually what you're doing is you're engaging and involving people in the co-creation of things that are being done to them. So you bring people with you and you foster a culture of teamwork and engagement and empowerment and all the stuff that we know creates high performing teams. So not everything has to be a question, of course, like Steve Holland, that I I was very privileged to watch coach on a number of times when he was with the 21s with Gareth Um, one of the best coaches I've ever seen works. He just think, he just keeps things really simple, yep. short, sharp, bit of technical feedback, bit of tactical input, get out. But the practice does everything else. And there's no nothing wrong with giving people some technical information to help them get better, because that's what we do as coaches, right? We just kind of we help people get better. But you can engage and involve people in that process. Um, and again, that's probably one of those shifts in my coaching as well. So. Not only has it been a shift in the type of practices that I use, um, but it's also been a, a, a fundamental shift probably in how I engage with the players as, as part of that process. You know, And a lot of it comes down to the role of the coach. You know, A lot of the time, the coach has the ego, it's all about me. You know, The result on a Saturday or a Sunday is a reflection of my coaching ability. Well, I don't think it is. You know, it doesn't, like, the under-8s that I used to work with, grassroots team, we drew one match and lost the rest, the entire season. Now, I don't know if that makes me a bad coach or not, but the kids had a great time. They're all still playing. I had a really good time. It was really good fun. But if I get hung up on that score as an outcome, as a, as a reflection of my coaching, then I'm kind of like, I'm beating myself up before I've even started. So I, I think that kind of evolution as a coach, yeah, that for me it goes back to that kind of yes it does depend but people need to start talking about it depends on what so so for example right i was going to do a uh a practice today that might have been quite unopposed and static it starts raining it's cold okay so now the it depends on is the weather so therefore based upon the weather it depends on the practice that i use so i would then change the practice and do a game where everyone was involved, everyone was involved running about the whole time so there isn't a clear, well, it depends on this. So it depends on the weather, right? That drives the outcome. But when people are start talking about it depends as a cop-out, start telling us what it depends on. So, well, it depends on what this kid needs. Okay, so if this kid needs X, what do you do? If this kid needs Y, what do you do? Don't just say it depends and stop there, because that doesn't help the coaching landscape move forward. So I think we need to really start to challenge and push back when people say it depends Great, of course it does. We get that. Depends on what, and therefore what. Uh, so yeah, so uh, that's probably the next stage of those kind of conversations that we need to get to. Rant over. <laughs> it's a great rant. And as you were speaking there, clearly I was listening to you, Nick. But I was also in my mind just thinking about some of the golf coaching I used to do, and and when a what. Um, what it depends when it depends can come in uh, and the decisions decisions i make as a coach and i'm thinking if you came along for a lesson with me 
God help you. But you came along for a lesson with me and um, you started hitting some shots and we started uh, to be creative about your shots. Perhaps I challenged you to hit it right to left or left to right um, or challenged you to contact the ball first and then the ground rather than the ground, then the ball, which we tend to do, right? You've seen me play, yeah? <laughs> I've been secretly spying on you on the golf course <laughs> uh, from, from a distance in the trees there with the binoculars. Um, and... and um, and you weren't quite getting it. What I would hypothesize in golf, as you're, as you're hitting a shot, is one of the biggest distractors in many respects is the outcome of the shot. Because you're so keen to hit it right to left, or you're so keen to, to hit the ground after the ball, or hit the ball first, or you're so keen to hit it left to right, that you might be paying attention to the wrong thing. You may be paying attention to the right thing, but you might be paying attention to the wrong thing. So when you don't get that uh, when you're not executing it correctly it it perhaps requires me and this is where the it depends nick isn't getting it that's okay what i'm now going to do is i'm going to take the ball out of the equation here so i might, might remove the ball um, i might uh, take you into a net and i might remove the outcome of the shot so i can direct your focus of attention um, so what I do as a coach will depend on the outcomes I'm seeing. It will depend on the uh, feedback you give me. Um, it will depend on the movement you're putting uh, uh, onto, the, onto the ball with the club. I think there's a lot of things, that, a lot of factors that I can think of where this it depends statement come into play. Um, but what you're doing is you're talking about it depends on this and therefore you would do this but that's what we want that's what that's what coaches should be thinking about not just hiding behind it which people do on a social media f uh, platform but you're doing exactly what i think coaches should do it depends on this therefore this is what happens next in my coaching i'm also thinking of a striker who approaches uh, the coaching staff and says yeah I want to practice my I want to practice scoring got to practice scoring got to practice scoring and and one of the things that winds me up no end and having listened to what you've got to say I dare say it's the same with you after the training session or towards the end of the training session where everybody is segregating to little groups and there's sort of a little bit of individual practice going on and what you tend to, to, to see at the, the, the elite level is coaches setting up um, a, a sort of strikers area where strikers yeah. can practice and often that involves a coach by the goalpost one of the goalposts feeding a ball uh, out towards the edge of the penalty area and the striker striking the ball um, uh, sometimes with the goalkeeper in there often with the goalkeeper in there sometimes not and it's often unopposed I'm not too sure how many times a ball is played out from the goalpost in a game towards the striker and there's nobody around and he just freely gets to strike it I, I'm always confused yeah, never. Of, of the value of that practice session. And I just listen, listening to what you were saying there, I just wonder if a better conversation to have and a d better direction to take is, OK, I hear that you want to work on scoring goals. I hear that you want to work on giving yourself the best chance to score on Saturday. Fantastic. What do you think you have to do to work on that what 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 exercise what activity what activity can we set up that's going to give you a better chance to score on saturday what would you like to do so asking that question setting up that activity for that player whatever that looks like and as that activity takes place i think the as you alluded to with steve holland creating the activity, setting up the environment, standing back 
allowing the silence to drive that player's attention and then intervening um, at the right points if there's opportunities to intervene, if there's a necessity to intervene. So player-driven, but not standing back and not doing anything, not being actively involved, but just finding pockets and opportunities to ask the right question, to make some coaching points, to offer choice. Um, to If the player's actually created something quite basic, such as, like we've described, just feed the ball yeah. out to me and I want to strike it, then actually offering choice of, well, can, can we bring an, another player in that might put a bit of pressure on you? Can we bring two players in here? Um, can we um, set a little uh, a small goal around this? And if you don't achieve the goal, what little um, what little consequence can we put in here? So just asking the player what they want to do, how they want to do it, and then building on that activity, using your knowledge as a coach to build on that activity to create a, a, a real rich learning landscape um, for that player to thrive in. Well, that's that's ultimately what they should be doing, isn't it? You know, uh, I'll probably go. I'll probably take it a little bit further and say, right, let's let's sit down with um, performance analyst and let's look at the last ten chances that you've missed and work out what kind of chance were they. So you're now doing something that's statistically shown as being an error in your game, right? Well, I've missed chances when I've come to the front post and it's on my weaker foot. Right, so we now know the kind of practice that we need to set up that will lead to a greater outcome because it's something detailed and specific in their game that they need to work on. Right, how do we do that? And then everybody kind of, like I said, we co-create the practice that becomes repetition without repetition. So it becomes game-based because you can guarantee that all of those left foot chances that they might have missed at the front post will not be identical you know, they will have pressure from a different side. They will have slightly different time. You know, they might have uh, half a second on one chance and three quarters of a second on another one. OK, so once I know the detail of that, that drives the actual coaching practice that we put on. So sometimes, you know, the, the striker might make the run with the defender close to him or not close to him. I might feed the ball one time. I might feed it earlier. One time I might feed it later. So it starts to change the variability of the practice, but it's realistic. So the player doesn't know when it's going to come or when it's not going to come because that doesn't happen in a game. You know, the player has to recognize the cues and triggers of the person that's about to cross the ball or deliver the ball, not the goalkeeper from, uh, not the uh, coach from the post because that's just nonsense. Um, so they have to recognize the cues and triggers of when to make their run, when not to make their run. But then I think as a coach, once you set up a practice that you can get that variability, so they're getting loads of opportunities, but everyone is slightly different. Mm. Um, that's then the time that you do your coaching. And that's when you can say to the player, what happens if you get across there earlier? What happens if the defender comes with you, but you hold him off to keep him away? What happens if you let the ball come later to you? What techniques do you now need to use to to be successful in trying to score. And that's where your coaching gets done in those kind of moments. And, and then, you know, there's no problem with the players going, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure what happens that you can then say, I think if you've got a, a straighter arm that's locked, you can keep him further away. That defender further away from the ball. He can get closer to you. If it's higher, you might be able to hold him off at a different angle. If it's lower, you might be able to punch around it and get him close to you. And that's the detail of, of coaching, isn't it? Certainly that, at that kind of level where a split second matters. But that's, that's where you set up a clever practice that gives the player some variability, but repetition and loads of goes, but everyone's slightly different. They're taking on board the cues and triggers from the environment uh, and... The, uh, the the lovely coaching jargon that's doing the rounds at the moment, affordances. Uh, uh, affordances is just a posh term about, well, what can you do in this situation? That's all it is, really. 
Uh, so in this situation, I've got the defender further away, therefore I can do this. Uh, the defender's tight to me, therefore I can do this. So what does the situation afford you the opportunity to do? Uh, and by being clever and creative with those little um, constraints on the practice in terms of timing of release, all those kind of things, you're helping the, the player with what happens on a Saturday because that's what we're developing players to do, isn't it? We want them to get better on a Saturday. Unless, unless your it depends thing is they just need some confidence in smashing a ball into a goal. Okay, well, that might be something different. But if you want them to help them get something for the game that's going to give some different outcomes, therefore you might look at practice in a different way. What I heard from you there, I'm going to throw some words back at you. I heard variation, spacing, uh, differential repetition or repetition without repetition I heard questioning choice instruction constraint person centred over the last decade how much better has the coaching landscape become at introducing those kind of concepts into um, every single sort of coaching level from grassroots right the way through to elite what's your experience how how much better are we at introducing that that kind of advanced coaching process into our coaching uh, environment I, I think I think we're better that's assuming that that direction of travel is better by the way um, uh, I, I definitely think from a from a formal coach education perspective, uh, I, I, I think where I see, uh, certainly, I, I mean, I'm talking football here, I'm not talking about other sports because I don't know their courses quite as well. Um, I think the best coaching courses that the FA ever produced were the FA Youth Awards. Yep. Uh, the Youth Coaches course that predated those I did mine in 2005 with, with John Opress, bizarrely, uh, a guy called Rod Thorpe, who yeah. is kind of uh, the architect of teaching games for understanding. Very fortunate to spend a lot of time with, with Rod. Um, at the, those courses became the FA Youth Awards. They were the best courses the FA's ever done, in my opinion, just my opinion. Um, they've now been embedded in in the kind of the level one to four pathway. Uh, so I, I think that those kind of thoughts and practices about learning uh, are, are better than they've ever befo- been before. I, I think the challenge that we have in coach development is, is that's fine if you go on a course, but the numbers of people that go from level one to level two are probably quite small. The numbers that go on from there, uh, people that did the course years ago probably won't have then got this new information. So I think the challenge that we have in, in sport, not just football, in all sport, is how do you then get that kind of knowledge out to people that might have already done a course before in a informal way or a coach development way? And that's the kind of stuff that that I, I do now in my, my role at UK Coaching is, is how do we look at this kind of informal yet formal way of coach development? So, for example, three of my team are out working with 50 coaches in the Olympic pathway. And, and these guys are working in any sport from taekwondo to rowing to boxing to hockey. Um, and what they're doing is they're developing coaching practice in situ support as a coach developer to help another coach. And that, I think, is probably the next frontier of, of coaching that we need to get to, is how do we make sure that coaches that might have already gone through a formal course then keep getting better? Because that's the challenge, is, is, is how do we keep doing that? Uh, you know, places like uh, uh, social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, etc., are good ways of having those kind of debates. Um, but the more little kind of communities of practice that we can get, where we have coaches from the same sport, or coaches from different sports coming together and talking about coaching, that's where I think we move people forwards. Um, uh and I, I spoke at a, a conference last year, and and I think it, it was around Talent ID at the time, 
uh, and a guy said to me, one of the questions was, um, but are you going into the top clubs and telling them that they need to do this? And I'm like, no. I don't think it's my job to tell them what to do. My job is to, to say, here's some information. Here's what cutting-edge thoughts, research, thinkers are saying about coaching, learning, talent. Do what you want with the information. You know, I, I, I'm now too old and got too much grey hair, like you pointed out earlier, uh, to worry about what people do with that information. That's their, that's their learning. That's what goes on inside their head. They've got to make sense of it and apply it in their context. Um, uh, but that's, that's the whole learning thing, isn't it? Learning isn't me taking what's, my, what's in my head and dumping it into yours. Mm-hmm. Learning is me creating something and allowing you to make sense of it in your way because you do the learning, not me. Um, uh, and again, I think it's just making sure that whether that's a, a coach development process or it's just a, a coach working with a player, um, you, you can't tell them what to think of something. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. So uh, when I was at Fulham, uh, in my age group at the time, and I'm not name dropping of players, but uh, it was Ryan Sessignon's age group and, and Ryan's doing pretty well now. Uh, but his brother was also in the same age group as they were twins. And um, uh, I'd done a practice on counter-attacking, right? And if, if football coaches are listening to this, um, you can have this game because it was a belter. It worked really well, right? So the game was, there was in two teams, 4v4, uh, two pitches, so they had 16 kids. 4v4 in each game. Uh, the rule was, if you kick the ball off the pitch, you've got to go and get it. So what that meant then was uh, there was a constant change in the numbers in the practice. It went 4v3, 4, 3v3, 3v4, 4v2, 2v4, 4v3. Because that's what happens in the game. You get pockets of moments where you have overloads and underloads, or it might be balanced. So this created this all the time. It wasn't just constantly a 4v3 practice. And it also meant I never had to collect a ball all night, which was awesome. And that's, that's, you know, that's an important factor for coaching. Great for the lazy coach. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so the games were going on. Uh, game worked really well. Uh, we, we talked loads about uh, all the different things about counter-attacking. Brought all the kids in together at the end to kind of chat about the learning we got from the practice. The lads were telling me, you know, they, they, the key things about when to attack, what the triggers were. Oh, I saw that someone was off the pitch, so they were, they were had no players in this area, so I recognised where to attack. Brilliant. I got all the answers I wanted to hear as a coach. And then Stephen Sessignon, uh, Ryan's twin, um, Steve said, I learned how to defend when outnumbered. So I'd done an hour and a half on counter-attacking, and what he'd taken from the, the practice was the entire opposite but for me, it was one of those massive moments of, oh, my God. Yes, absolutely. He's a, he's a fullback. He's, you know, he's, he's won the World Cup. He's played in Fulham's first team in, in the Caribou Cup this year. His mindset is defensive. And he's, uh, he's taken exactly what he needed from the practice, yeah. not what I was trying to give him. And, and it was one of those moments that's just like, oh, man. You've killed me here, but you're so right. You're absolutely right. Um, so uh, as coaches, we need to kind of consider that around the learning aspect as well. And it's a vital part that we need to think about. It's not just what we think, it's what the players think. Using that word learning, I think learning is a neurological process. Um, yeah. It happens quite often in the in-between as you've alluded to there, um, the interaction between coaches and players, the interaction between the task, the activity, and the player, which it did there for Sessignon. It was his perception of the activity and yeah. his experience of the activity that um, shifted something neurologically that, 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 that embedded... Um, something into his mind and in his nervous system that uh, gave him some aha moments and oh, okay right this is what I have to do here and this is how I can see it there and I can I can have this body shape here and yeah. so it's his interpretation um, 
it's a neurological process and that smacks of psychosocial and um, I know that you know about my vociferous communication when it comes to psychosocial. I've always wanted to get the word vociferous onto a podcast. so I've, I've... It's, a, it's, a, it's a strong word. It's a really it's, strong word. I like it. Uh, so, you know, I'm, so, I'm a sports psychologist, so I, I, I guess I understand I'm going to have some heuristic biases here. I'm going to have some cognitive biases, but I'm, I'm going to... Um, uh, throw uh, a narrative out at, you, out at you and it's not a question as such I just would like you like a, a comment I suppose at, at four o'clock as a grassroots coach when perhaps at four o'clock when I'm sitting down and I've I've suddenly got some headspace uh, within my working day perhaps or I've just crept off away from the, the computer and, and into a, another room and I'm writing down the activities I want to deliver. I have to consider the psychosocial aspects of those activities, of the environment in which I'm going to be delivering those activities and which the players are experiencing those activities. At 630 um, when I get to the venue and I'm setting up the activities, if I have the luxury of being able to do that, um, then I've stepped into the environment and I have to con- start to consider how I want to conduct myself throughout the session. I might want to consider the what-ifs, and uh, such as what if it doesn't quite go to plan, or as you've alluded to there, what if a player throws me a curveball. At 7 o'clock as players start to arrive, um, and I start to have communication with those players... Um, I uh, ask them questions, I have conversations, I greet them, I might greet parents, etc. And then at, at 7.30 as I start my activities and, and, and I deliver, I execute, um, I'm, I'm, uh, 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 I have to execute with regard to the words we've said, variation and spacing and, and questioning and choice and instruction and all the kind of things, if, as you say, that's the right thing to do. And then after the practice itself, um, I, I have to communicate with players. So all of that, for me, involves a considerable amount of psychosocial. And I say this, psychosocial is always there. It is not a corner as such. I can't simply say, I have to tick the psych uh, corner here. I have to tick the social corner. It is all psych social. For me, we're so social. Maybe we always say that psychology comes burdened by definition. You know, it's almost like I have a problem, so I need to see a sports psychologist. I think coaching comes burdened by definition. It comes burdened by de- definition of it, it's about performance and 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 skill act, and and people don't necessarily coaches don't necessarily look beyond that. They don't say every single second is psychosocial here, and I'm not too sure if whether looking at it in terms of corners or. Tr- just not treating the coaching landscape as a discipline of psychosocial helps coaches be the best that they can be. As I said, there's not a question there. It's just a narrative stroke rant. But what's, what's your thoughts on that? Um, am I subject to heuristic biases here? Do you think that every single second is psychosocial? Where do you lie when it comes to that? Well, I, I mean, I, I probably have to declare my bias at this stage that my partner is a sports psychologist uh, so my life is uh, sports psychology oh, my word. Uh, <laughs> which is awesome because you know some of the conversations that we have uh, around a work context are yes. fascinating and she's way too she's way too clever for me I, I learn a lot uh, and, and realize how little I know in kind of every conversation I have with her which is awesome for me as a coach because I just keep getting better um, uh, well I think in its simplest sense uh, could you do a session that was just technical? I, I, I don't think you could. I think it's impossible. It, it, it's impossible. Um, so, so therefore, it does engage in all those other kind of uh, corners in the sense of how they were kind of set up in that kind of FA four corner model. But the big thing for me is it's always been, and it goes back to some of my kind of the working under Craig Simmons for so long is it 
it's the blending of all of those bits that's vitally important it always comes down to blending it you cannot separate those parts uh from the first interaction you have with a kid it impacts in that kind of psych social bit so for example um when i worked at uh, at the academy there was one kid whose parents were split up uh if he if he's been with his mum for the last few days he was a very different kid to if he'd been with his dad for the last few days so my walk down to the training ground and chatting to this lad was oh how you been who's dropped you off today where have you been staying the last few days what have you been up to in a throwaway comment that he might think oh yeah I, i've been with mum. i've done blah, blah blah for me that's really important information because i can start to understand the headspace he's in because dad's an alcoholic and it, it, home is then very different for him uh and the conversation walking down to the ground is not just a conversation that's building rapport and relationships with him of course it is but it's also helping me understand where he's at today so then you know if he's not fully at it then i might understand why but if there was a direct correlation between he was not aggressive but he would be flying into tackles if he'd been with dad because there's a bit more pent-up frustration. Um, So I I would have to think about his role that I set up in the practice at that time. So this, this is then the detail of coaching and, you know, the, the, the the coach, the grassroots coach that, that tries to grab some time to plan his session is how do you think about planning your sessions for the benefit of individuals? You know, so this kid at this time, he may need this, he may need that depending on what's going on. And that goes back to that it depends bit. But the it depends for me is who who would he been with? Therefore, the outcome is generally I know if he's been with one place, I need his role to be in a less physical area where he's not going to come into contact with too many players. Because if I put him in centre midfield, he's going to be smashing people left, right and centre. Now, because the it depends is then as a direct outcome as to what I do from a coaching practice. But that is the psychosocial in action. The other part that I think that coaches need to start to consider is how do they use coaching and match day to develop psychosocial skills? Because what, what we do as coaches in any sport, what we do is we just help people get better as people. And, and I, I said on Twitter years ago, you know, you know, coaches, you know, or grassroots football is not judged by the amount of trophies that you win. It's about the difference that you make to people. And, and I think any sports system, whether it's in the talent pathway or, or it's grassroots, this is about people and developing people. So we know that the numbers that get through in an elite pathway to become elite is very small. And, that's not a fault of the system. That's just because there's not that many jobs. You know, if we if we need 30,000 teachers in this country and all of a sudden we start training 120,000, that means that 75% of those teachers aren't going to get jobs. Now, that's the system. So the system in football is there's not that many jobs, so the success rate is small. You can't give everyone a job. Um, so we've got a duty to develop better people. And we just happen in... In, uh, in the world that I live in and one that you work in quite a lot is we develop better people through football. So how do coaches set up practices that are going to help develop psychological skills, social skills that are going to help develop better people and we just use football as that vehicle to do it. So I'll give you a practical example. Uh, I'm setting up a game and in a square, four kids, there's a goal in each corner and the top left corner plays against the kid in the bottom right. The kid in the top right corner plays against the bottom kid in, in the kid in the bottom left. So they're playing diagonally. And it's just a 1v1 practice. Can you score in the goal in the opposite side? So there's a bit of confusion because you've got players running across each other that are still playing in their own little 1v1 game. You can play that for four minutes. Physically, that's hard. It's hard work. 1v1 for four minutes is hard. So you've got some physi- uh, physical outcomes in this practice. Now, that practice for me is a site practice because what I then do now is I'm using this to develop communication skills. So after 
the top left has played the bottom right. He's now going to, the top left is going to play now the bottom left. But the person in the top right has already played them. So those two go and have a conversation. What were they good at? What was the, what was the other person good at? What were they not so good at? What did you do that was successful? What did you not do that was successful? So they're having a 30-second conversation about the practice. Keep rotating them around. So, but every time you're having a conversation about the person that you've just played against to help the other person, what information could you give them? Oh, I did this and I didn't do this very well. Or when he does a step over to his right, he, he's not very good at going left. So they're, they're sharing information. Then you can build it up into a 2v2, a 4v4. You can take it where you want. But the richness of that practice comes in the development of communication skills between the football bits. So there's some technical returns because they're doing 1v1s and loads of them. There's some physical returns because it's just bloody hard work uh, and you can't get lazy. Um, and there's some psychosocial stuff because I'm interested in the conversations so if somebody is not able to communicate, that's where I can then coach. So if they're, if they're struggling to have a conversation, I can then stand there with them and go, well, what kind of things did you try? Or what was successful for you? Or what stopped you being successful? So as a coach, I'm now prompting and nudging that communication along. But the outcome for me is it's a, it's a psychosocial outcome. Um. And by the time you get a 2v2 to play against a 2v2 on another pitch, there's even more because you've got a dynamic of four people doing this kind of stuff. So I, I think it's how coaches are clever and use practices, games, to develop psychological skills in young people that's going to support them to be better people in whatever they do in, in life. Because it's not just about the game. And you're referring to young people there. Most of my work is at the elite level. Yeah. And at the elite level, what you said is precisely, in my opinion, what coaches need to be doing or at least consider. Yeah. Because the amount of conversations I have with managers and coaches at the elite level who say, we haven't got the leaders and perhaps bemoan the millennial generation. There's yeah. a lack of leadership. It's very difficult to help players team now because of things like mobile phone technology and, and, and various millennial mindsets, if you like. That may or may not be true, but the reality is, is are you utilising your sessions, your activities, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, going into a weekend, if we are focused on the game, are you utilising those activities and sessions to help players experience moments of leadership, help players experience pockets of communication so that they can become a better communicator. Are you, are you creating activities that is actually going to tap into vulnerability? Yeah. And then the mental skills work that myself and the coaching staff are doing, we can test that. Are players going to utilize their ability to shift their attention? Are they going to use their self-talk in that moment to get through that acute challenging moment of performance that that, that that demanding moment that we've laid down in an activity and I think that what you've said there is absolutely spot on in terms of every single activity every single session is enveloped in psychosocial and needs to be enveloped in psychosocial what I think about when you're talking is psychosocial is always there because we're dealing with people, we're dealing with human beings, we're dealing with the bio-psycho yeah. piece here. But also, I, we can do psychosocial deliberately, you know. Yeah, but that, absolutely, uh, spot on. But that's where football, football environments, sometimes elite sport across the board, yep. um, th like, they kid themselves, we're player-centred. No, you're not. You tell them what time to be there, what to wear, when to fart, when to go to the toilet. Like, you tell them everything. They don't make a decision. And then you wonder why you've got no leaders. Well, because you're not allowing them to stand up and make decisions. You know, like, so I, I used to sit 
see it and like it, it used to frustrate me but we talk about all of these kind of things and then we do everything for the kids and it's the same with elite players we then do everything for them and wonder why they can't make a decision but but we have to we as a coach you have to let go of your own ego and realize that sometimes you're you're, you're developing people for the better purpose and oh and by the way we also know that uh, uh, people that are engaged more in a process self-determination theory people that are engaged more in the process they have that sense of belonging will start to p- perform better like it, it's it's not a coincidence um so i used to see it on you know england camps with some of the uh, elite players uh right well coaches will stand up and lead the um the, the parents meeting at the end i'm like well, we'll get the players to do it get the players to do it involve the players in everything that you can at different uh, different stages and and i can remember uh a shift when gareth came in and gareth is probably the best thing that can happen to the england football team in terms of connecting the pathway creating a really good environment and and relationships with the players he, li- he, he lives the psychosocial stuff in, in its full kind of way and i can remember when he they were playing spain a couple of years ago uh and he sat down around a sabutio table with uh, um three senior players henderson Lallana, and dyer right how we're going to press in midfield and, and the players led that discussion for an hour yeah, I always used to hear, well, elite players can't do anything. They don't get, you know, they can't sit down for 20 minutes and have a team meeting. Well, I don't like being talked at for 20, 25 minutes either. I'll get bored, I'll switch off, I'll probably remember very little of it. But engage me in the process, and I'll tell you what, you've got a chance. And that's what Gareth, I think, is doing really well for for that end. And that's what the best elite coaches do. They don't just survive from week to week. They create environments that are engaging, dynamic, empowering and and those ones go on to produce better people and probably win stuff as well, which ultimately at the top end you want. Whereas if we're doing that at a younger end, we're just going to produce people that stay in the game forever, have a fantastic time and develop better rounded people. Now, for me, that's success. That is winning. And I think that's probably uh, as much as we can consider from, from coaches, it's not just about trophies and medals, it's about developing better people. I concur, and um, Nick, thank you so much for those thoughts, uh, really appreciated, and I know uh, the audience of the Sports Psych Show will uh, have really enjoyed some of those um, golden nuggets, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, Nick, where can uh, people find you, um, learn more about your work, um, learn about some of the, the great stuff you've spoken about today? Um, well... Uh, you found me in trees with binoculars, didn't you, on the golf course? So, yeah, you know, but can't I'm, be a, that bit, hard I'm a bit weird that way. So, uh, <laughs> for, for, for the normal functioning uh, human being who are my audience. Um, so, yeah, I use Twitter uh, at nlevitt, L-E-V-E-T-T. Um, I've got a blog called the Rivers of Thinking or riversofthinking.com. Um, I've been a bit lazy on there recently. Uh, it, it's, it's mainly where I have kind of my rambles about different things. Um, but yeah, riversofthinking.com or at N. Levitt on Twitter. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, mate, thank you so much for joining us. And will you come back again in about a year's time, six months' time? Oh, look, we, we've just touched the surface on stuff here. Now, I've, I've just you've just got me going now. So, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good stuff. It's great to see you, mate. Great to see you. Thank you so much, mate. So, if uh, everyone, if you enjoyed that, please do leave a rating and a review. And don't forget to subscribe to the Sports Psych Show to be alerted about future episodes. I look forward to uh, next week's episode. Bye for now.